Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of joy, praise, and gratitude, hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling blessed in Jesus this morning, filled with his spirit, and compelled to live a life of obedience that will bring him much pleasure and joy. Now, we're continuing our study of the book of James, and today we're going to begin in chapter 2. But before we begin, as I have begun my 60-day reading of the New Testament, and I encourage you to do so as well, I finished the book of Romans last night. And I can't tell you how blessed I was in that reading. It was as if I had never read it before. And that's the splendor of God's Word. It speaks to us each and every time we open it, we feast upon it, we meditate upon it, and we ponder it. And because it blessed me in such a new way, I wanted to go back and see our study through the book of Romans. And I have to tell you, in the most modest of ways, I was really blessed. As I listened to the insights as God the Most High gave me as we went through that study, I blessed myself. Because it wasn't I who was speaking those words, but the Holy Spirit who was speaking through me. And so even I, the one who was giving the teaching, was blessed, inspired, challenged, rebuked, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, who is sounding his message so loud and clear. And so I want to strongly encourage you, if you get a chance, go back and listen to that study again. For it is deep in truth, it is profound in wisdom, and it is truly meat for our souls. Well, with that being said, let's begin in James chapter 2, and let's remind ourselves of what we've discussed so far. When we were last together, James is reminding us that we need to live a life of discipline. And not just a life of discipline on what takes place outside our bodies. In other words, the things that we perform, but we are to give much attention to the desires, the motives, the intentions, the things that are going on in our hearts. Because oftentimes, these things are so overlooked. We can be jealous without even realizing it. We can be envious without even realizing it. We can harbor resentment, contentions, and argumentative spirits without even realizing it. And so as we examine our hearts before the Lord each day, let us pray that he will reveal things to us that we're not even aware of. Because oftentimes it's the things that we're not aware of that are so damaging and crippling to our spiritual growth. And that's where James picks up today in chapter 2. He says, My brothers, my sisters, do not have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. In other words, do not think better of yourselves than others. Do not look down upon others. And friends, we do this without even realizing it. When we see a beggar on the street or someone who is asking for money outside of a store, the first thing that crosses through our mind is a disparaging spirit. We are revealing spirits of prejudice, and yet in that moment we don't even realize it. And yet James here is not necessarily speaking of what takes place outside the fellowship of God. He's speaking to the discrimination that is going on within the fellowship of God. For he says in verse 2, If there comes one into your assembly, into your fellowship, a man with a gold ring and dressed well, and yet there comes in a poor man in vile raiment, not dressed well, carrying a stench about himself, and yet you respect him that wears the gay clothing. You hug him that has the gay clothing, that, that is dressed nice. And yet you find yourself resisting, drawing back from the man who carries the stench. And you say unto the man who is dressed well, sit here in this good place. 
but you tell the man with the stench, stand thou here. You will not even allow him to sit because you don't want his stench to be upon your furniture. Are you not being hypocritical? Are you not being judgmental? Are you not showing partiality, discrimination, prejudice? Are you not harboring evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Listen to me, my beloved sisters. Has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised them to love him? Why? Because they are absolutely dependent upon the hand of God to care for them each and every day. The more that we obtain in this life, the less need we have for God. That's what James is saying. But these who have nothing depend solely upon God because of the very fact that they have nothing in this life. And yet notice, James says they are rich in faith. You could learn something from them. You depend upon your job for your income. You depend upon your own effort to supply the needs of you, your family, and your home. But these depend absolutely upon God and Him alone to provide for them. They don't even know where they're going to sleep tonight. They certainly don't know where their next meal is coming from. And interestingly enough, here in March the 5th, 2018, two-thirds of the world are in this position. They are desperately poor. And yet we are surrounded by the comforts of this life. And we are so blessed with all the things that we have that we neglect to think about and we forget about those who are in desperate need. Well, James continues in verse 6 and he says, Why is it you show partiality to the rich? Aren't these rich men the one who oppress you? Do they not draw you before the judgment seats? The poor aren't treating you that way. It's the rich. It's those who have the many things that this life offers that are your enemies. They even blaspheme the name of Jesus, that worthy name by which you are called. If your focus in verse 8 was to do what the Lord Jesus required of you, to love your neighbor as yourself, you would do well. But you must remember your neighbor is the poor just as much as your neighbor is the rich. And so if you have respect to persons, you are committing sin. And you are convicted by the very law that you say you keep. And because of this, in verse 10, you are unjustified before God, because as you offend in this one area, you are guilty of breaking the whole law of God. For the same God that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. So if you do not commit adultery, but you kill, you have become a transgressor of the law. And this is the law that you will be judged by. So let your life be one of exercising mercy. For the mercy that you show is the mercy that you will be shown. If you refuse to show mercy, you will not be shown mercy. Well, some might say at this point, yes, but I have faith. I believe in the work of the Lord Jesus. I believe that he is the promised one. Well, if you believe so much, why do your works not show your belief? When you see someone who is not well clothed, when you see someone who is hungry, and yet you say unto them, depart in peace, God bless you, yet you refuse to meet their needs, to feed them and to clothe them, you show by your works that your faith is dead. You puff yourself up because you believe in the Lord Jesus, but your works that should follow that belief are empty. Even the devils believe in verse 19, and they tremble under that belief. So this should prove to you that your belief is not enough. Do you not see, O vain man, O empty-headed man, that faith without works is dead? Wasn't it Abraham, the father of our faith, that was justified by his works when he attempted to sacrifice his son Isaac upon the altar? Don't you see in verse 22 that it was by his works that his faith was made perfect?
that it is by works in verse 24 that a man is justified and not by faith only. Again, faith without works is dead. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot justified by her works when she hid the spies and kept them from being caught and killed as she let them go out another way? For you must understand, friends, that as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. In other words, if you take the spirit out of a man, you have a lifeless body. And so it is with our faith. If you take the works out of our faith, you have a lifeless body. And Jesus came to give us eternal life. And so if we are a part of his eternal life, then we're going to be busy doing the things that he did. And that is loving and caring for those whom the rest of the world forgets. Not to make disparaging remarks about them, not to treat them with unkindness, not to be unmerciful or uncompassionate, but to love them, to meet their needs, to meet them where they are, to extend a hand of fellowship, an arm of comfort. And so what James is basically saying that if we are truly filled with the Spirit of God, if we are living our lives according to His commandments, and we are walking upon this earth and among the people of this earth, we're going to seek out intentionally the most unloved. And it is those that we will befriend. It is those that we'll give our time and attention to. And it is those that we'll treat with the utmost respect. Because we'll see past the veneer of the clothing that they're wearing, of the skin that they're in. We'll see past the stench. We'll see past of human appeal to the eye. And we will look into their souls and see that this is one who is in desperate need of the grace, the mercy of both God and man. And so as we focus our attention <clears throat> upon living disciplined lives before the Lord, let us give our utmost concern to the things that are within our hearts, not hiding them before God and certainly not hiding them from ourselves, but being transparent and honest. And if we see a resistance that would cause us to shun certain ones, let us go broken before the God, the master, the king, the savior, and let us plead his forgiveness and ask that he would change our hearts and give us a love that must be exercised where it is needed most. Oh, friends, this is a message that applies to each of us, no matter where we are in our journey, because we all have this hesitance within us to touch one who has been so discarded by this world. I mean, we would have to admit, if we were standing by Jesus, when he reached out and touched and hugged and loved the leper, instead of taking two steps forwards, we would have taken two steps back. And it is this within us that James is reminding us of, that he is even rebuking us of, because this is a spirit of the flesh, not the spirit of God. And if our truest desire is truly to walk as Jesus walked, to be as much like Jesus as we can, then this is an issue that we should not only come to a resolve with, but that we would seek our Lord until he truly changes us from the deepest parts of our hearts so that there is no longer any inclination of resistance or hesitancy so that we can truly show the love of God without any inner conflict, regardless of race color, background, lifestyle, belief system, daily habits and practices, personal hygiene, and even sickness and disease. Oh, brothers and sisters, may God the Most High give unto us a true spirit of heavenly love that we would pour out upon all those that we meet. In the name of Jesus in the character of Jesus, in the person and the spirit of Jesus. 
Well, I love you, friends. I'm so thankful again that you're with us. I pray that you're being challenged and motivated to be more faithful to the teachings and the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ as we work our way through this precious book, the book of James. Now, as our Father, His Son, and His Holy Spirit so wills, I deeply love you. I'll see you on the next video.